Would you like to host your own radio program or podcast? Park City Productions 06604 is a Bridgeport, Connecticut-based radio broadcast solutions company. Follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's Park City Productions 06604. Call us at 203-522-8801. From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio WYBC and 1490 AM WGCH Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. The most powerful and secretive corporate enterprise you likely have never heard of with annual revenues greater than Goldman Sachs, Facebook, and U.S. Steel combined, and its largely unknown owners with huge unchecked political influence. The inside story of the Coke Industries, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Christopher Leonard was on our show for his shocking inside story on the meat business in his book, The Meat Racket, and he's a business reporter whose work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, and Bloomberg Businessweek. And the latest epic investigative work already has won the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award. It's Cokeland, the secret history of Coke Industries and corporate power in America. Welcome back, Chris. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is epic already. Seven years in the making. And uh, I have to say, did you purposely write this so sort of even-handed, you know? It's hard It's hard to get your arms around. Are these guys evil? Are they good? What the heck? So... It was extremely intentional how I wrote this. I mean, I, gosh, it's almost hard to unpack that. As a journalist, I'm firmly convinced people do not care what I think. What they do care about is what I can report on. You know, I'm sort of the reader's ambassador. I can fly to Wichita, Kansas, where Coke is based. I can spend weeks and weekends knocking on doors, interviewing the executives, the former executives, and finding out how this institution works how the leaders think, what the institution is doing, and how it affects our lives. And I think it's really important as a writer to stand outside. You know, whether I agree with what Charles Koch is doing or disagree with what he's doing, it's just very important for the reader to understand what he's doing. And and part of that is to, to illustrate and to write very clearly about and we can get into all this, but, you know, for mm-hmm. example, what Charles Koch believes. Mm-hmm. You don't need my opinion about what he believes, but let's get accurately on the page what that is. It's interesting um, that that approach is sort of going out of style, which is kind of sad. Now, it's pronounced Koch. It's spelled Koch. Tell people what is Koch Industries to begin with. That's right. And you know what? It's funny. They love that nobody can pronounce their name. We'll get it. You know, it's a secretive company for a reason. Koch Industries is a, you could call it a giant industrial conglomerate. As you said, the massive uh, revenues every year bigger than Facebook, Goldman Sachs, U.S. Steel combined. And this is a corporation based in Wichita, Kansas, that specializes in the kinds of businesses that we depend on every day, that undergird civilization, but that never carry a brand name on it. Coke refines gasoline. It sells fuel. It operates pipelines. It makes nitrogen fertilizer that's the bedrock of our food system it makes building materials insulated wall panels carpeting the chemicals in our clothing like lycra spandex and nylon that are in baby diapers shirts exercise clothes it makes the chips and the sensors in your phone or in your car at root i would say it's a giant private equity firm, okay? It's privately held. It's basically owned by two people, David and Charles Koch, and they see themselves as investors. They generate billions in cash a year, and they're always looking to expand, to branch out into new industries by buying other companies, and that's why they're so diverse and so large. In fact, that leads me to uh, where I was going to go first, which is they're a private company, which in and of itself is very different. They don't have to adhere to Wall Street's quarterly stuff. But they're not a private equity firm the way we see them, which is over-leveraged companies that are sort of uh, bought, stripped, 
take out all your equity you can and then resell it, right? These guys are real long-term guys. They also buy distressed assets, which someone like Buffett would never do. This is patient capital, and you're, yes. you're exactly right. It's not load down with debt, strip, and sell. They buy and hold. Um, you, you know, to back up, it, it's privately held. The firm was uh, based in Wichita, Kansas from since the 40s, and it was started by a guy named Fred Koch. His son Charles took over, and they have been very intentional to keep it private. Uh, The book opens in 1981 when some J.P. Morgan bankers flew to Wichita and tried to convince Charles Koch to go public. He would have gotten a $23 million payday if he'd done it, but he refused because he knew that staying private could let the company, A, plow all its profits back into itself to keep growing, but more importantly, it could keep a long-term strategic view. It wouldn't be a slave of quarterly earnings, so it could think long-term. And that drives to the point you make. When Coke buys an asset, they're almost certainly going to hold on to it for 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And they're not looking at, is it making money this quarter? Is it losing money even this year? They, they look on a much longer horizon. Now, um, that was, in my mind, a, a quarter of a good sign, um, a lesser good sign, and we'll do you know more of a sort of case study, is that they have the freedom to step on unions and, you know, be kind of shady, stay, stay under the hood, those kinds of things, which don't look quite as uh, good behavior. You know, the, Charles Koch is a, a tremendously powerful person, and he has extremely strongly held views about how, how the economy ought to work and, frankly, how the whole nation ought to work. Yeah. And all those issues you just talked about, labor unions, environmental regulations, yeah. taxes – these are all seen as as, as unjust <laughs> infringements on the market, and that sounds. I'm not, I'm not kidding. It really is unjust infringements on the market, which you, you got to let market forces rule the day, if you will. What is market based management? Okay, market based management is. It, it, it would be too simplistic to call it the corporate culture. Ever since the '80s. Charles Koch has been developing this management theory that he's named market-based management. This is the literal operating manual, the code of conduct to be a Koch Industries employee. When you get hired at Koch, you fly to Wichita, you spend three days in a basement auditorium learning this very detailed philosophy called market-based management, which has its own vocabulary, its ten principles. The ten principles are printed on the company coffee cups. And after you've been at Coke for a few years, these people speak with this vocabulary that really only they understand, these very loaded terms like point of view and humility. They mean something totally different to a Coke Industries employee. And Charles Coke has written two books, but I say three books, the first being a company pamphlet I have. He's written three books on market-based management, and he says it truly is the blueprint for how you should organize a corporation, a society, and and a culture. One thing I was interested in, this is, you know, make sort of a component of it, they get rid of budgets when they take over these companies. And all I can remember is being at IBM, where it felt like they had 70% of the people in headquarters spending months doing the budget, right? And, And from all the countries, there's fudges all the way up. And then you get it approved, and then the next day you start on the amended budget because that one was phony. And, that, and that's what goes on, yeah. all for quarterly earnings. And he comes in, and you would think this is, would lose control. He says, let's get rid of the budgets. Exactly. And, I, you know, a big part of that is this firm has been rooted in energy and commodities since the 70s. Highly volatile yeah. markets. So talk about blowing out a budget. Oil prices could double or drop in half over half a year. And so budgets were always a pain in the neck. And one of the people I interviewed for the book is the former chief financial officer of Coke named Lynn Markell. Mm -hmm. And he recalled this meeting where they were sitting around and talking exactly about what you were talking about, that they just had teams of people investing so much time trying to come up with this budget estimate and then hit the budget estimate. So the tail's wagging the dog. (laughs) And one of the benefits of being privately held is that uh, an executive named Paul Brooks spoke up and said, why don't we just ditch this? And Charles Koch said, yeah, ditch it. Uh, They don't have to answer to shareholders on Wall Street. 
they don't care about externally meeting some earnings per share measure. And so it's not like they're just free-flowing with no paperwork. They do have goals, revenue goals, but it's, it's not the kind of budget system that way down the time and thinking of a lot of publicly held companies. We have about 90 seconds in this segment. Tell us briefly who Charles and David Koch are, and they're worth $120 billion combined, which is more than Buffett or Gates. So there, Fred Koch, who started this company, had four sons. The oldest, Freddie, never wanted to have anything to do with the business and left Wichita. Then there was Charles, who essentially took over the family company, and David is his younger brother, Another brother, Bill, left. We can talk about that. It was very bitter. But David and Charles essentially owned the entire Coke industries between them. You'll see the Business Talk with Jim Campbell, over 350 stations around the country. Go to biztalkradio.com. Find the one closest to you. Listen over the Internet. Access our podcast. We'll look uh, deeper inside the ruthless world of Coke industries in the next segment with Chris Lennon. back with business reporter Christopher Leonard. And uh, before we dive into some stories, by the way, did you get to meet Charles Koch at all? Does the guy talk to anybody? He rarely talks. I did meet him in 2015 when he released a new book about market-based management. I interviewed him about that book in his office, and Mm -hmm. we talked for about an hour. Mostly the book is based on the people who work with him, know him, and court documents, transcripts, and things like that. All right. Um... This uh, one of the initial uh, you tell great stories in the book, too, by the way, with great characters, um, this story that has that appears to have them stealing oil off of Indian lands. Tell us a little bit about that and its impact, I guess, on on compliance down the road. Well, this is a really important moment in Coke Industries history. So when Charles Coke took over the company at the age of 33, one of their biggest units was an oil gathering service. They were actually the largest oil gathering company in the United States, meaning they would send the truck out to the well to pick up oil from a big tank and take it to market. The evidence is simply overwhelming that over many years, Coke Industries had a a standard practice of taking more oil than it paid for. (laughs) Uh, Okay, in in vernacular English, I say the word stealing, others say the word stealing. Coke is very unhappy with that word. (laughs) But what would happen is a Coke employee would go to a well and say that they took 100 gallons, I'm sorry, 100 barrels, when in reality they took 102. Well, if you do that all day long, you're gathering millions of barrels of oil without paying for it. Coke admitted in court it, it, it earned roughly $10 million a year in profit from oil it didn't pay for. Now, were the guys that were actually doing the work, were they told to do that? How, were the, how was it conveyed? I interviewed a gentleman named Phil DuBose, who's Mm -hmm. not the only person who says this. I'm just using this name as a representative Mm -hmm. example. Yeah, the bosses said, go out there, and they use the terminology long and short. You collect more than you pay for if you're long. And they said, you've got got to be long. And they posted uh, the results of how much oil you gathered without paying for it. And if you were short, you would get in trouble. So they were explicitly told to be long, if you will, to gather more than they paid for that is confirmed by court testimony, uh, interviews, and tons of evidence. So did this, once they got caught at this, did it change? Because there were Senate hearings even. Was, um, was this behavior changed in their culture over time? Is, have they looked always to cut corners? Okay, so this was a pivotal moment in the company's history. In 1989, the Senate investigated it and released a report saying Coke stole oil. It wasn't Uh, in any way um, ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Two things happened. The first is that Coke Industries realized we cannot be politically uh, unconnected anymore. You know, Charles Coke, as we've said, libertarian, lived in Wichita, didn't want to have corporate lobbyists, didn't want to be in Washington. They realized that structure wasn't going to work anymore. This is the old saying in Washington, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. (laughs) Okay, so this is in 1990. That's when they really start to build out their political influence apparatus. And the book shows how they used it to 
help quash this investigation into stealing, they didn't clean up their act immediately. Through the 1990s, you see a number of criminal violations, uh, uh, pollution, accidents, that are indicative of a company that is pushing the limits, uh, frankly, crossing the limits. Mm -hmm. It reaches ahead in the late 1990s. We can talk more about that. And and finally, Charles Koch says, stop, no more. And they do reform the company culture in the year 2000. It it is interesting. Um, Before we go to the next story, probably the toughest war they ever felt, interestingly, was against their brother Bill, right? That's right. Um, As we mentioned, uh, you had Charles, who ran the company, and he actually had two younger twin brothers. David is a twin with Bill. And, you know, this fight is written about in a tabloidy way of brother versus brother. It got extremely ugly. Bill Koch, I don't think he's he's given it up to this day. Hmm. He he hired detectives to dig through trash. He planted negative stories about his brother. But at at the heart of the fight was... A business dispute. Bill Koch wanted to make the company publicly held. He wanted to pay out much richer dividends to the owners. And Charles Koch's view was, no, we're going to be private. We're going to think long term. We're going to plow profits back into the company. That's how the dispute started. And it just exploded into litigation that literally lasted 20 years. But on the other side of that, uh, Charles Koch has iron control over this firm, and he has for over 50 years. And quickly, I would like to add, you'll notice I keep talking about Charles, Charles, Charles. Yes. David Koch was described to me as a a silent partner, if you will. He formed a truce with his brother Charles. He didn't try to overthrow him as Bill did. And David got about 50% of the company. But, you know, Charles drives the business. Charles drives the strategy. Charles even drives the political strategy. David is more public-facing, lives in New York, has his name on big buildings, but the company's really run by Charles Koch. All right, I want to talk about union busting now a little bit, but from two sides. One, you can tell us the um, Pine, Bed, uh, um, Pine Bend refinery story in Minnesota. And the other is this labor management system, which looks like a great tool for productivity enhancement, but it looks like it sucks labor's... Uh, their spirit dry. Yeah. Gosh, you read the book. Oh, it's a great book. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is so much nicer to talk about it with someone who's read it. So labor unions, surprisingly to me, were a critical part of this story. You know, in 1972, uh, right after Charles Koch took over the company, one of the biggest disputes he faced was with what I would call a militant labor union that operated up in the Pine Bend oil refinery. Coke industry's most important asset, no question about it. It's a super profitable oil refinery. But this labor union, as was common at the time, back in the early 1970s when unions were so powerful, it had all of these seniority rules and workplace safety rules, and the union had pensions, and the pay was really high. Uh, and, and Charles Koch, when he bought this refinery, sent a Texan named Bernard Paulson up to the refinery. And I interviewed Paulson, and he told me clearly his job was to break the union. And they waged a nine-month battle. The union went on strike because Paulson wouldn't negotiate a contract, essentially, with them. And uh, it was a very, very bitter dispute. But at the end of the day, Charles Koch and Bernard Paulson broke that union. They tamed it, essentially. And it was a really interesting story to me because you saw the faults of the labor union. I mean, it was the labor union that resorted to violence and thuggery. The labor union committed industrial sabotage. They literally crashed a freight train into this refinery. could have killed everybody on the inside. They were doing it to protect their livelihood. I understand that, but you can kind of see why the public lost faith in labor unions at this time. I got about a minute to go on this. I didn't realize they owned Georgia Pacific. That's right. They had a lot of death issues there, though, and safety issues. They did, and if we get to that, fast forward to today, when labor unions are essentially gone and powerless, yeah. we see the problems that made them get created in the first place. Increasing worker injuries, lower pay, miserable working conditions, that is all present at Coke Industries today. No pensions? No pensions. Well... 
Uh, they pensions get that are under attack. Yeah, 401k. This is Talk with Jim Campbell from our flagship stations, WYBC and WGCH Greenwich. The trading business and beating up California next. We're back with Chris Leonard. This book is Coakland, The Secret History of Coke Industries and Corporate Power in America. And I was fascinated by um, their their information strategy with information asymmetry, they call it, taking all that uh, utilities and um, commodities experience and turning it into trading uh, benefits. But, you know, the California power story, which you might refresh us on, and really the Coke Industries was Enron without the exposure. That's exactly right. They were Enron, but yeah. they didn't want to brag about it. Yeah. And I felt that this story of what happened in California was such a microcosm of what happened uh, in, in America. As you said, Coke was one of the biggest commodities derivatives trader in the world. And they realized early on that the most important resource they dealt with was information. It wasn't coal or natural gas. And they built an amazing information analysis machine at their trading offices in Houston, Texas, Geneva, New York, they would gather data on everything they ever did in the energy space. You know, remember, they're running pipelines. They're selling natural gas. They're selling crude oil. And every price point they ever got, they would feed into a system to learn and anticipate what was about to happen. So they're running this hyper-sophisticated trading group. And there was a movement in the 1990s to bring this trading world to electricity production. And this gets right to the heart of one of these huge debates in our country is how should our markets be structured? How should monopolistic businesses like power utilities be structured? We had a lot of fights about this stuff, and we had the New Deal, which created this public utility system. Enron and Koch used their political influence to change that public utility system and create a trading grid. And they did that in California and the record shows, without a doubt, that immediately when this new trading market for electricity came online, the traders began gaming it. They began manipulating the market. Coke used a strategy called, quote-unquote, parking. Yeah. frankly, too complicated to really get into, but it was a shell game. And they were essentially gouging rate payers in California for hundreds of thousands of dollars of trade, causing electricity prices to spike, and then causing rolling blackouts across the state. So what you see here are very powerful companies with enormous political influence, and they redraw the policy picture around a market, manipulate it. But ironically enough, it was the politicians who paid the price at the end of the day. It was the governor of California who got recalled. And it wasn't really revealed the role the traders played uh, until years later. And it's funny because the politicians basically are stupid. The way they, you know, they, they just set this thing up so that smart traders. And the very thought in my mind of having a Wall Street trader set the uh, utilities prices has got to be like the dumbest thing you've ever heard. And you, and you said they are, they're all sort of laughing behind the scenes, right? And by the way, I was also, they made more money, Coke, in this trading stuff than in the physical underlying businesses that they had. That is exactly right. We talked about information. Coke bought a pipeline company just for the information it would yield. It was called Gateway Pipeline. Coke didn't care about the pipes or the gas. It cared about the data it got from that. Coke made a multitude, magnitude level more money trading natural gas derivatives than it ever made trading natural gas. I mean, uh, selling actual natural gas. So let me ask you this, because... Uh, Mr. Koch wants no government interference. He wants unfettered capitalism. But this was a great example uh, of both in California, but then when we hit the mortgage crisis in 08 with all the derivatives there, that the regulators were completely asleep and Wall Street was issuing complete junk. And uh, as you know, we know what happened after that. Yes. You know, the, the politics break down really fast. It's very messy because... Look, markets are a creation of rules, and that's all they are. And it's just really how the rules are written that matter. And Coke benefits because it can master highly, highly complex systems, 
like oil trading, like oil pipelines, like electricity trading. And when you work in that environment, it's not this clear picture that there's this organic market and that you need to get the government out of it. Like, could I please give one example really quickly? Sure. Oil refining. You know, that's Coke's bread and butter. The United States hasn't built an oil refinery in, in, since 1977. And the reason why is because the sprawling regulatory burden of the Clean Air Act. We all think the Clean Air Act more or less is a good idea, yeah. but its imposition means there's no new competition. Well, Coke exploits that position in the market. Brilliantly. Brilliantly. It knows how to manipulate um, clean air rules. It knows how to uh, monitor and handle clean air rules. It can afford the building full of lawyers. And so here it is benefiting from the sprawling complexity of the regulatory state, while at the same time pushing the so-called deregulatory agenda to open up electricity markets in, in California. So how does, I mean, they wanted to dismantle the EPA, too. And without the EPA, which has a lot of problems, we all know now, without it, um, every lake in this country would be completely polluted. So does, does he really believe unfettered capitalism works? Yes. And is fair? Yes, yes. Really? And I've read... And he's smart, I, he's smart though, too. He is smart... Um, I just tell you, I've read his speeches. I've probably read every issue of the Coke Industries newsletter going back. I think they started publishing it in the 90s. And mm -hmm. he just talks again and again and again that the problem of pollution in rivers can be solved by a market system and pricing. And, and he sticks to the story. It, and, and it's easy to complain about the Environmental Protection Agency. It, yes, it is. Nobody likes getting a speeding ticket. But what gets lost in a lot of the debate is the economic gain that comes from uh, having clean air, having clean water, not having to you know process water as much because it doesn't have heavy pollutants or carcinogens in it, the cost for health care, et cetera. Now, you say in the book... Um, the, you know, we have on the one hand this, they hold these um, businesses they acquire potentially forever, but that they're driven by a trading mentality. What does that mean? Because they don't turn over their companies fast. Here's what the trading mentality means. Okay. I, I think it's at the heart of Coke Industries. The key to being a great trader, which is buying and selling stuff, that's all it is, buying and selling. You could be buying and selling a barrel of oil, mm -hmm. or you could be buying and selling a company like Georgia Pacific. The key to doing it well is to know more about the world than anybody else, more about the world than your competitors and the people you're doing business with. So what that means is Coke's entire business is focused on learning and gaining deep knowledge about the world and keeping it a secret and trading on it against other people. If somebody wants to sell you a barrel of oil for $50, if Coke knows the barrel's actually worth 52 it's going to buy all the oil it can for 50 and wait for the world to wake up to the reality that it's worth 52 and then sell it. That's a trading mentality. That's, that, that gets transferred, for example, to Coke's acquisition spree when it buys these other companies like Invista, mm -hmm. Georgia Pacific. It's been studying these companies for years, if not decades. If Coke is selling you something, Coke is learning about you. It's not only measuring the price you're willing to pay. It's learning how you operate your business. It's learning your business cycle, the ups and downs, and it's going to use that to trade. And it's also going to mean they're going to buy when nobody, when people, other people are scared. That's right. You know, to take a quick example, in 2003, a huge agricultural company in Kansas City called Farmland Industries went bust. Mm-hmm. And they had a bunch of nitrogen fertilizer plants that nobody wanted because they were profoundly unprofitable. Yeah. Coke had been studying those plants for years, and it knew that the natural gas cycle was going to change again. It bought them for pennies on the dollar, and now they are some of the most profitable assets Coke owns. I don't really understand that either. I mean, I, you, 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 it just churns money out. And then the, the big thing was what? They just bought it at the right cycle? So... A, a nitrogen fertilizer plant is nothing but a natural gas refinery. You oh. take in natural gas, you process it, nitrogen fertilizer comes out the other side. Oh. Nitro, uh, natural oh, gas God. prices got super high, and that's what made the plant so unprofitable. And Coke thought, you know, 
prices will go back down. Mm -hmm. What Coke did not even anticipate was the fracking revolution, which brought natural gas prices to the basement. I mean, they brought natural gas prices lower oh, than yeah, that's right. okay. any forecaster ever would have thought. Well, I'll tell you what didn't drop was demand for nitrogen fertilizer yeah. and crop prices. So your retail price stays high. Your input costs plummet through the floor. And that's why I say they are spitting That's a nice cash. formula. Oh, yeah. we, got, we got under a minute to go. Why did Purina Mills fail? Bad due diligence. Coke yeah, yeah. borrowed a lot of money, bought. They, they seem to go against all their principles you just talked about, which is know the business and don't put debt on it. There's no question. I call the chapter about that off the rails. Yeah. The company was growing too fast in the 90s. They didn't do due diligence. They bought this company that was a mess and then discovered it, unfortunately, after the fact. Listen to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Our final segment, we're going to talk Coke politics. Final segment with uh, Chris Leonard, who did spent seven years investigating the Koch family, if you will, and he's built this um, this political influence network that, with all the money they collect, is sometimes as close to a billion dollars over an election cycle. Tell us briefly what Americans for Prosperity is, and I'll tell you what blew me away was Trump nationalism, trade wars, things that are against unfettered capitalism. They were able to defeat Trump. They defeated Trump. There's no question about it. They turned the Trump tax plan into the Koch tax plan before I think anybody even knew what was <laughs> happening. Americans for Prosperity is one of the most effective and innovative components of the Koch political machine, which is a multifaceted machine. Koch's political machine includes, you know, a registered lobbying shop and a bunch of think tanks to help seed the ideas of Washington. <laughs> but Americans for Prosperity is literally a nationwide army of employees and volunteers. It is a boots-on-the-ground force. Here's how Coke will use it. Coke has one of the biggest lobbying shops in the United States. Those lobbyists are some of the smartest people you'll ever meet about politics. They know what's going on in Congress down to the minute. So Coke can arrange busloads of angry voters from West Virginia, North Carolina, Missouri, Ohio, to arrive in Washington, D.C., and go exactly to the congressional offices that Koch's lobbyists have told them are the most vulnerable and the most important to visit. When you get that kind of mix, uh, you can change legislation, and you can definitely affect political outcomes. They would, they'll even defeat Republicans, right, if they're not far enough into, I guess, almost libertarianism? Well, I'll tell you what, I think that's their, well, I know from reporting, that's their main objective. <laughs> um, one of the people I interviewed was Steve Lonigan, who is a one of the very early chapter heads for Americans for Prosperity, and he told me, Charles Koch told him, the Democrats are lost cause. We're never going to change them. What we're going to do is, is target Republicans. We're going to make them more libertarian and act how we think Republicans ought to act. And in 2010, you might remember that, you know, putting a price on carbon emissions or regulating yes. greenhouse gases, that was bipartisan. Yeah, they beat the crap out of that, right? They sure did. Now we're but talking cap and trade now, right, and the carbon tax. We're talking cap-and-trade, carbon tax. Any Republican who dared confess that global warming was a problem, Coke would burn the ground around them, isolate them, and put them out of office. And, I mean, there, there are multiple, multiple cases of this, to the point where Coke had a, literally a pledge that legislators would sign, effectively saying that they would never put a price on carbon. Which you said Mike Pence signed. Mike Pence was one of the earliest signatures of that. Yeah, he, he signed it and um, has been on board with that. You know, there was an extremely conservative congressperson, congressman named Bob Inglis, yeah. who took the opposite track and felt that climate change was a pressing threat that market forces could solve, and Koch led the effort that kicked him out of office in 2010. Okay, Chris, so I'm going to push you now on this even-handed stuff you're behind. Okay. This is a fossil fuel-dependent firm, yeah. essentially a global warming denier, Right. They're working under the hood here, even defeating a Republican president. Is that good? Uh, well, can I put it this way? <laughs> can I put it this way? When cap and trade was defeated in 2010, 
the, there were about 362 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Right. We broke the threshold of 400. It is undeniable carbon in the atmosphere makes the earth warmer. The costs are going to be enormous. Mm -hmm. Coke has played a role more important, I think, than any other corporation in America to forestall and derail efforts to regulate these gases or, or stoke the alternative, you know, solar, wind, and air, which sounds like such a hippie idea, but let's not forget that it was the federal government that essentially created fracking over decades with tax breaks, research, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't, Chris, then wouldn't it be responsible for them to start uh, making acquisitions in alternative types of energies, non-fossil, and be part of the support of the system? N never underestimate the force of gravity. This, <laughs> comp this company has sunk investments worth at least billions of dollars in refineries, pipelines, mm -hmm. tank leases. But then also think about the future revenue of fossil fuels flowing through those refineries and pipelines. We are talking trillions of dollars over decades of potentially lost revenue if there's a massive switch away from fossil fuels. So the cost is extremely heavy. It's not just that Coke can start building wind farms in Kansas mm -hmm. and replace those lost revenues. This is not an easy position for a company like Coke Industries to be in financially. Um, is What's the future of uh, – what do you see the, their future being? What, where do you see them going next, and who's going to succeed Charles? I believe Charles will be succeeded by one of three people, senior executives at the company, Jim Hanna and David Robertson and uh, Brad Rizuk. These not are Chase Cook. Coke. No. So Charles has a son named Chase. I don't think he's going to be the next CEO, Okay, but I think he will be CEO. Okay. Yeah. We're going to have an interim CEO is my, for what it's worth, my 10 cent prediction. Yep. I think Chase will take over the company one day and he's, he's quite an impressive person. I interviewed him, interviewed uh -huh. people who knew him. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, and you don't see any big change in their footprint. Just, they're just going to go and get bigger, bigger, keep eating stuff up. Absolutely. There's no foreseeable pathway where Coke Industries is smaller or less influential than it is today. I just don't see it. So they're a critic of crony capitalism, but aren't they a manifestation of it? They benefit every single day <laughs> from the regulatory dysfunction yeah. of our system. They are the um, poster child of an incumbent economic power that benefits from the status quo. We just talked about the mess of oil refining, which delivers huge profits to them every year. So, you know, as we talked about, their wealth doubled under Barack Obama. Yeah. They win in a dysfunctional system. And they felt he was the devil. If you read Koch's newsletter, you would have thought those eight years were when the socialist armies were on the march. Exactly, and they doubled their... What, yeah. I, what also blew me away was um, you, you saying that uh, they have this long-term view, and they can sit and know they're going to outlast Trump. And, you know, Trump's attention span is about six minutes. And it, it's kind of scary in a sense that, you know, they're just going to wait him out and then stop all this nationalism, you know, populism, um, trade wars and stuff over time. I think that that's right. There is, however, anxiety in the Koch network. If Donald Trump wins re-election. Yes. He will reshape the Republican Party. And you see this movement in the Republican Party of America first yep. economic nationalists. Yep. Coke is patient, flexible, and adaptable, and they will wait it out. But, but they won't, you don't see them coming around to Trump-ism? Never. <laughs> it's inconceivable. It's literally inconceivable to me. Well, that's a great ending. Uh, the, uh, the book is fascinating, and there's a lot of great stories in it, and they're a scary power in many ways. Thanks to Chris Leonard. That book is Cochland, The Secret History of Coke Industries and Corporate Power in America, the result of seven years of investigation, a great piece of work. It's been a business talk with Jim Campbell. Thanks to Chris Leonard. Thanks to our national audience for listening. See everybody next time on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.